This Week at NASA. Thanks for coming out and greeting the crew for what is the final, uh, final opportunity to do this, at least in front of a space shuttle. Um, and I couldn't think of a, of a better backdrop. The final space shuttle crew spoke with reporters at the Kennedy Space Center's Launch Pad 39A as they completed the terminal countdown demonstration test for STS-135. The TCDT gives the crew and support personnel time to familiarize themselves with equipment and procedures surrounding an upcoming launch. Two, one. The four veteran astronauts are targeted to lift off aboard Atlantis for the International Space Station on July 8th on what will be the final mission of the space shuttle era. The space shuttle program has been amazing what it's done, all the great accomplishments, and you just don't want to let that uh, momentum down. And uh, so there is a lot of uh, a lot of pressure to do your job right and, to, and, like I say, to finish strong. Crosshairs are aligned and contact. Contact and capture confirmed. The International Space Station welcomed the Progress 43 unpiloted cargo ship, carrying close to three tons of food, fuel, and supplies for the six Expedition 28 crew members on board. And we have separation confirmed uh, 46 minutes past the hour. That came several days after the unpiloted European Space Agency's Johannes Kepler automated transfer vehicle 2 undocked from the station. ATV-2 had delivered several tons of supplies to the crew in February. A day after its undocking, ATV-2 burned up on re-entry over the Pacific Ocean. Good morning, I am uh, Lika Guhatakurta. NASA experts uh, spoke at the annual Space Weather Enterprise Forum held at the National Press Club in Washington. Space weather refers to conditions and events on the sun and near Earth that can threaten human safety and hamper national security by impacting critical systems like electric power grids, communications, and satellite positioning and navigation systems. Collection of older crew members is a benefit rather than younger in terms of how much radiation they can be exposed to because of the, the finite period at which time uh, radiation might uh, express itself. Dr. John Allen addressed the increased exposure to radiation faced by astronauts during adverse space weather conditions and what can be done to prepare them for such events. The Space Weather Enterprise brings together researchers, policymakers, forecasters, and others to share information and raise awareness of space weather and its effects on society. Space weather is predicted to increase as the sun reaches its forecasted peak of activity in 2013. When you were training to be astronauts, no one had ever had that job description before. So what did astronaut training entail? Everything. <laughs> Every test you can imagine. Fifty years after the first human space flights, NASA's two surviving Mercury 7 astronauts, John Glenn and Scott Carpenter, sat down to talk about their experiences at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington. Uh, NASA's predecessor, National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, was doing some studies on a computer they had down at Langley uh, that were about orbital flight and they wanted someone to come down there and, and uh, sort of go through some of that. And I went down, I volunteered for that. And uh, that's when I think we first realized that we really were going into this, or I realized anyway. The order said, report to Washington at such and such a time. Do not discuss or speculate with anyone. So I obeyed, I did discuss and speculate with my wife, however, I went and to a briefing at the Pentagon, and that's how I heard about the NASA project. On February 20th, 1962, John Glenn piloted his Friendship 7 spacecraft on the United States' first orbital Mercury mission. At age 77, Glenn flew in space a second time in 1998 aboard Space Shuttle Discovery on STS-95 after representing his native Ohio in the U.S. Senate. Scott Carpenter flew into space on May 24, 1962, aboard Aurora 7, a three-orbit science mission. The fourth American in space, Carpenter also performed important habitability research on the ocean floor. The Ames Research Center hosted a tribute to Baruch Barry Blumberg, 
the former NASA scientist who identified and developed the vaccine for the hepatitis B virus. Blumberg died after suffering a heart attack earlier this year at the International Lunar Research Park Exploratory Workshop at Ames, where he was a featured speaker. And now, centerpieces. A good idea rarely goes out of style. Just ask some of the firms developing next-generation spacecraft. Sierra Nevada, one of four winners of second-round funding from NASA's Commercial Crew Development Program, based its Dream Chaser design on the HL-20 space taxi concept. That idea was developed by NASA's Langley Research Center in the 80s and 90s. Company and NASA headquarters officials came to the center in Hampton, Virginia to recognize those studies and Langley's 50-year history of lifting body research. We're proud of the work that we at NASA did on HL-20 on the lifting body concept and we're pleased that it's being utilized today. We would not be here, I would not be at this podium if it wasn't for the great work that you did. Langley engineers devised an entire plan for the HL-20. They created pilot landing scenarios for flight simulators, some of which are now adapted for newer facilities. They tested designs in wind tunnels and even built a full-scale model with the help of universities to study crew challenges. That model is at Sierra Nevada. Many of the researchers who gave birth to the HL-20 attended the recognition ceremony. We really appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to get together again and uh, the, uh, the recognition that you provided us for a job that we were excited about, we still are excited about, and quite frankly, I thought this day would never come. Also while in Hampton, NASA's Deputy Administrator Lori Garver and Chief Technologist Bobby Braun got the chance to see a new manufacturing technique developed at Langley that could revolutionize the way aerospace parts are made. Two, one, With a blast of confetti, Center Director Lisa Rowe and several elected officials cut the ribbon to celebrate the opening of the new Green Headquarters facility at the Langley Research Center. The first new building constructed at Langley in 35 years, it covers 79,000 square feet and houses more than 250 employees from six different center organizations. Today's ceremony and the building behind me dramatically signify a new Langley and the completion of the first element in our revitalization plan. The new structure uses some of the newest technology to reduce its impact on the environment. Its roof deflects heat and reduces stormwater runoff, and geothermal wells assist in heating and cooling, all to achieve the highest rating by the U.S. Green Building Council. These buildings will stand as an icon in this community for that science, for that technology, for that development, for what NASA does each and every day and for what it stands for going in the future. So we're working to really design that laboratory of the future. The second element in Langley's revitalization plan, an integrated services building that will house a new cafeteria, conference center, and additional office spaces, will break ground later this year. Walt's flight facility became Rocket University for seven days in June as more than 120 high school educators and university students and instructors spent a week learning about rocketry and conducting science experiments in space. We've learned a great deal. There's a lot more to rockets than I ever dreamed of. Um, we've gotten to actually build rockets hands-on, make our own. We've got to shoot them off. A lot of nice people to talk to and, and learn how they do things at other schools and, and what their specialties are. Flying on this NASA Terrier improved Orion suborbital sounding rocket were experiments constructed by the student participants. You get to do this part, I'll do the next part later. I mean, it was a, it was a lot of teamwork that was involved for something that was so little. Three, two, one. <laughs> After launch and payload recovery, the participants conducted preliminary data analysis and discussed their results. It was a great day for a launch. Uh, we had perfect weather. You could see everything clearly. Uh, great skies, great uh, winds, lots of people, lots of excitement. Awesome. Uh, one of the best launches I've ever seen. The annual week-long workshop is supported by NASA's Sounding Rocket Program, the Office of Education and the agency's National Space Grant College and Fellowship Program in partnership with the Space Grant Consortia of Colorado and Virginia. This is experience absolutely incredible. Heck yeah, I'm coming back next year. We have three main engines up and running. Two, one, 
and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Atlantis on a mission that will herald a new day of international cooperation in space. 16 years ago, on June 27, 1995, Shuttle Atlantis became the 100th U.S. human space flight launched from Cape Canaveral, embarking on a mission that would link it with Mir for the first U.S. space shuttle Russian space station docking. STS-71 would also mark the first on-orbit changeout of shuttle crew. Atlantis Commander Hoot Gibson and crew brought with them the members of the new Mir-19 mission, Anatoly Solovyev and Nikolai Budarin, and would return home with the Mir-18 crew of Norm Thagard, Vladimir Dezhirov, and Gennady Strekalov. Over a five-day period, astronauts and cosmonauts conducted joint biomedical and scientific investigations. Atlantis undocked on the 4th of July and landed back at the Kennedy Space Center on July 7th. And that's This Week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, log on to www.nasa.gov.